In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is a story about light and pursuing stars and listening to dreams. Pursuit of knowledge or wisdom is often part of the human story, tugged as we are by the curiosity of our natures, an experience some of us might have had late night on the internet on Wikipedia, where you start looking up one question that you had, and then you bounce to another, and then another, and another, and pretty soon it's one o'clock in the morning, and your bed beckons. Following the pursuit of dreams and of visions often leads us to truth, boundaries crossing as it is, transgressive, leading us beyond nation, or religion, or political allegiance. Truth is transgressive, you see, and embarrassingly promiscuous, belonging to no one, loyal to no party. Truth is unsettling and risky because it can bounce from person to person. No, he's right. No, she's right. He's wrong. No, she's wrong. Consider the quality of the light in the story today. We have light appearing elsewhere in the Bible. Consider the story of Moses. Here's a quote from uh, John Newell about the story of Moses and the burning bush. I'm reminded of the story that my rabbi brother Nahum likes to tell. It's a story of the burning bush in the Hebrew scriptures in which Moses sees a bush on fire, but the bush is not consumed. Nahum says that the important thing about the story is not that the bush is burning, but that Moses notices, for every bush is burning. Every bush is on fire with the divine presence. Everything in the universe shines because God is at the heart of it. So it is in our epiphany story. It is a story that invites us to open our eyes to the light that is everywhere. You see, part of looking for revelation is recognizing that the light of Christ is actually already in the world. It's inherent in creation. Christ didn't come to be in the incarnation when he was born on earth. He already existed from before time in the beginning. He was there when the whole universe was created, and it shines with his light. What would it mean to see the divine fingerprints on everything? What would be the consequences? I was at a baptism recently in which somebody, uh, uh, and I, I... I know to my shame that I'm not exactly sure of the scholarship behind this, and John uh, Hill, if he were here, could describe it, but they've added to the list of promises that one makes in baptism one that involves the care of creation. And when I heard that, I, I recognized in that something of the theological insight behind this notion, that the creation is all shining with God's presence if we have the eyes to see it. Consider also the quality of this life that we celebrate in the child Christ. This is a baby king born in a backwaters town in an occupied nation, a king who nonetheless is a baby, weak, infantile, vulnerable. To get that sense of vulnerability, one that never goes away, as we see in the crucifixion. Consider this story from Frederick Buechner. This appeared in his book, The Birth. Beware of beautiful strangers, said one of the magi astrologers, the wise men, and on Friday avoid travel by water. The sun is moving into the house of Venus, so affairs of the heart will prosper. We said this to Herod, or something along those lines, and of course it meant next to nothing. To have told him anything of real value, we would have had to spend months and weeks in studying and calculating the conjunction of planets at the precise moment of his birth, and the birth of his parents and his parent, their parents back four generations. But Herod knew nothing of this, and he jumped at the nonsense we threw at him like a hungry dog and thanked us for it. A lost man, you see, even though he was a king. Neither really a Jew nor really a Roman. He was at home, nowhere. Neither the Olympian Zeus nor the Holy One of Israel who cannot be named. So he was ready to jump at anything, and he swallowed our little jingle whole. But it could hardly have been more obvious that the jingles were the least of what he wanted from us. Go and find me the child, the king said. And as he spoke, his fingers trembled so that the emeralds rattled together like teeth. Because I want to come and worship him, he said. And when he said that, his hands were still as death. Death. I ask you, does a man need the stars to tell him that no king has ever yet bowed down to another king? He took us for children, the sly lost old fox. So it was like children that we answered him. Yes, of course, we said, and went on our way, his hands fluttering to his throat like moths. So why did we travel so far to be where this happened? Why was it not enough just to know the secret without having to be there ourselves to behold it? To this, not even the stars have an answer. The stars said simply that he would be born. 
It was another voice altogether that said, go, a voice as deep within ourselves as the stars are deep within the sky. But why did we go? I could not tell you now, and I could not have told you then, not even as we were in the very process of going. Not that we had no motive, but that we had too many. Curiosity, I suppose. To be wise is to be eternally curious, and we were very wise. We wanted to see for ourselves this one, before whom even the stars are said to bow down. To see, perhaps, if it was really true, because even the wise have their doubts. And longing, longing. Why will a man who is dying of thirst crawl miles across sands as hot as fire simply for the possibility of water? But if we were longed to receive, we longed also to give. Why will a man labor and struggle all the days of his life so that in the end he has something to give the ones he loves? So finally we got to the place where the star pointed us, and it was night, very cold. The innkeeper showed us the way that we did not need to be shown, a harebrained, busy man. The odor of the hay was sweet, and the cattle's breath came out in little puffs of mist. The man and the woman, between them the king, we did not stay long, only a few minutes as the dock goes, 10,000, thousand years. We set our foolish gifts down on the straw and left. I will tell you two terrible things. What we saw on the face of the newborn child was his death. A fool could have seen it as well. It sat on his head like a crown or a bat, his death that he would die. And we saw, as sure as the earth beneath our feet, that to stay with him would be to share that death. And that is why we left, giving only our gifts and withholding the rest. And now, brothers, I ask you a terrible question. And God knows I ask it also of myself. Is the truth beyond all truths, beyond all stars, just this? That to live without him is the real death, and that to die with him the only life? The quality of this truth, of the Christ that we proclaim, is that his life and his death have a power over us, that could cause us to die now, every day, at the end of our lives and eternally. And we're not just talking about a figurative sort of spiritual death, one of a, a moment's conversion or a, a fleeting instance of the heart reaching out toward the divine. No, no, we're talking about something much more real, much more practical, much more frightening. People die all the time for this truth that we proclaim. Consider that later we'll be singing the hymn, The Huron Carol, a famous uh, Canadian Christmas hymn, uh, Twas the Night of Wintertime. Uh, that was written by Jean de Brubeuf, and I'm sure I'm killing the French pronunciation of his name, but he was a Jesuit missionary, uh, and he was tortured to death for proclaiming this truth that we're going to sing in a few minutes. Consider your own lives and what brought you here today, what kinds of things you had to overcome. Storm, slick roads, um, the inconvenience of getting up on a Sunday morning when you could sleep in. They seem trivial in comparison to what many have given up for this truth. So the quality of this light and this truth is something different from any other truth that we might proclaim. The story about following stars and listening to dreams, is that what we're to do? Where would that lead us? I propose to you that if we do that, if we follow stars, and if we listen to those dreams, it will take us to some very risky and scary places. But as our Lord says, it is only by dying that we gain eternal life. So friends, as we customarily do, I'm going to open this up for comments and reflections in response to this Feast of the Epiphany that we're celebrating.